Welcome to today's webinar in the Resilience and Memory in Archives, Libraries, and Museums series. We're glad that you could join us. This is the first of these talks for the fall semester, and the Institute for Advanced Study will be hosting more of these. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that the Indiana University Institute for Advanced Study recognizes that Indiana University is built on the ancestral homelands and resources of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people. We acknowledge and honor these indigenous communities, both past and present. I'm Suzanne Godby Inglesby, Associate Director for IU's Institute for Advanced Study, and it is my pleasure to welcome you, our attendees, and also our speaker, Dr. David Polly, today. David Polly is chair of IU Bloomington's Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Indiana University and a faculty research curator at the IU Paleontology Collection. And we're very pleased to have him giving this first talk in our Resilience and Memory series this semester. Dr. Polly is a vertebrate paleontologist who studies the evolution of mammals and other vertebrates in the fossil record, including trait-based studies of community response to the environmental change, geometric morphometric analysis of evolution and morphology, phylogenetics, biogeography, and speciation on regional and continental geographic scales. Almost all of his research is based on the study of museum specimens, which is particularly uh, relevant to our repository-based research series. Dr. Polly has served as president of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, director of the IU Center for Biological Research Collections, and associate director of the Environmental Resilience Institute at IU. He has also been an Edward P. Bass Distinguished Vis Visiting Environmental Scholar at the Yale University Institute of Biospheric Studies. Today, he will be discussing resilience, climate, and species, perspectives from deep time. After the talk, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, which you can place either in the Q&A, which hopefully you see at the bottom of your screen, or in the chat. I will be looking at those. We'll save those questions until the end of Dr. Polly's presentation, unless you have a question about something he has just said, which I will try to catch and I will ask him. But otherwise, I'm going to pop off the screen until we wrap up and then it's time for us to have a chance to chat at the end. So if you have questions or comments, please feel free to include them at any time and we'll address them at the end. So welcome, David. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you everyone for coming. I see that um, some familiar names in the audience, um, including some of my European colleagues and colleagues outside of Indiana. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, resilience, climate, and species. And some of this is related to um, really the research of some of my former students, um, as well as my own. Um, but I want to link it to the state of Indiana. So some of you who are not from Indiana, um, you'll learn a little bit about what has happened in the central Midwest. And I want to start with this book on the screen um, by Jean Stratton Porter called A Girl of the Limberlost. And Jean Stratton Porter is one of the literary heroes of the state of Indiana, um, was a very popular writer in the early 20th century, um, certainly across the United States. And this particular book, Girl of the Limberlost, was one of her uh, most widely read. And um, assuming that most people have not actually read it, um, it's a really interesting book to read from today's perspective because it really is a um, story about environmental change. Um, it has as its heart sort of a, a coming of age story in it, um, but it also has the, the turning of Indiana's environment um, in it. The Limberlost Swamp um, is indeed now lost. And the, the story, the plot of that um, the plot of that book is set in um, the narrative that I'm about to give you of um, environmental change in Indiana. So if you look at the state of Indiana today, uh, most people who are not living in Indiana have mostly passed through it, if you've done that at all, either passed through the airport or passed through on one of the interstates, um, where you would see mostly open farmland. Um, and the map here on the left is showing um, what the landscape looks like today. 
um, forest in green, wetlands in blue, which you may not be able to pick up on a Zoom screen. There's um, a little sprinkling of them, especially across the northeast part of uh, the state. Um, some prairie in black, um, also very difficult to pick out um, in, in Indiana's current form, um, but lots of agricultural land, which you see in yellow. Um, and quite a bit of developed land, which you see in red. And over on the right, you see some of those biomes as they would, would look um, either today or in the past. Um, wetlands um, were often forested in, in Indiana. Um, deciduous forest is the dominant non-agricultural biome. Um, and then there's prairie, which if you're not um, paying attention as you pass through, most of it may look like prairie um, because that's what the agricultural lands look a little bit like. Um, but if you step back to 1800, before Indiana was settled by Europeans, the map looked like this. And it is in exactly the same color scheme as the last map. Um, so forest is in green, um, wetlands in blue, prairie in black, agricultural land, for which there was none at that point, and urban um, land, which there was none at that point, um, are in yellow and red. And at that point, forest covered 87% of the state of Indiana. Uh, wetlands covered another big, um, um, another, another large percentage, um, and prairie as well. Um, some of the wetlands were open, but much of them were also forested in a, in a swamp-like um, environment. Um, and here on the right, you see some of the trees um, from the late 1800s. This is a tulip tree in Scott County, um, Indiana, which is sort of in the central to northern part of the state. Um, and you can see three individuals sitting at the base of that tree. Um, and I want to describe a little bit of um, what this land was like um, at that time. In 1895, so almost a century after this map, um, the president of the Indiana Academy of Sciences, um, Amos Butler, um, said in a presidential address, um, describing what Indiana looked like previously. He said, over the greater part of this state were spread dense forest of tall trees, heavy timber whose limbs met and branches were so interwoven that occasionally could, find, could sunlight find entrance. There was little or no undergrowth in the heaviest woods and the gloom of these dense shades and its accompanying silence were terribly oppressive. Mile upon mile, day's journey upon day's journey stretched these gloomy shades amidst giant columns and green arches reared by nature through the centuries of time. Um, and in the late 18th century, um, not long before uh, Butler was writing, um, all of this land had been cleared um, and some scientists recognized the environments that were disappearing. So the photograph on the right was taken by an ornithologist, um, Ridgeway, um, who tried to document what the forest looked like um, as they were disappearing. And he recorded that in the Wabash River lowlands, which is sort of on the eastern side or the western side of the state, that the average treetops were 130 feet um, with monarch trees, tulip trees and cypress that were as much as 180 to 200 feet tall, um, which is um, far taller than any tree you would see today. Um, the wetlands up in the northwest, um, more than half of the area north of the Wabash River, and for those of you who aren't familiar um, with Indiana, there's a river that comes roughly down, um, crosses the state here, and then forms the, the river light border over on the west. Um, north and west of that, the wetlands um, were so extensive that during certain parts of the year, um, you could go by canoe between uh, the Wabash River down here and Lake Michigan, um, which was up there. Um, the prairie that existed um, was sort of on high ridges that were um, ancient glacial moraines um, between those wetlands. Um, that was tall grass prairie with grasses that were somewhere between five and eight feet high, so roughly um, the height of, of a, an adult human or um, even taller. Um, that was, quote unquote, so matted that it was difficult to force your way through. And on highlands, there were stinging nettles that grew shoulder high. Um, so the landscape was completely different in 1800 than it is today. And what happened over 
the 19th century is something that we normally think of today happening in places like the Amazon River Basin um, or Borneo or Indonesia. Um, it was basically slashed and burned and cleared for agriculture. Um, so the history of 19th century Indiana was one of deforestation. Um, and here are a few statistics of how that changed. Um, so going back to 1800, um, there were about 87% of the state was deciduous forest. By 1870, nearly 70 years later, less than 30% of it was forested. By 1917, time of the First World War, um, only 7% was forested. Um, today, there has been a rebound. We're back up to about 20%, um, but that's less even than 1870. Um, most of that was cleared for agriculture. Um, the wetlands were drained. Um, tiles were put in uh, to the soil to um, drain the water out. Um, and so there were some 36,000 square miles that were cleared between 1800 and 1870. And of course, without the benefit of chainsaws or bulldozers or anything else, it was done by girdling the trees, um, cutting around through the bark so that the tree dies. And the one in the center picture here, um, another photograph by Robert Ridgway, um, is a girdled tree that's in the process of dying um, and then burning them um, or taking them down with axes. And if you estimate how many trees were removed based on um, densities of what the forest likely was, there were something like 2.2 billion trees removed between 1800 and 1870, um, which is roughly 32 million trees per year for, 72, for 70 years. Um, and that comes down, if you divide it into days, an average of 86,000 trees felled every day, every day of the week, every month of the year for 70 years on end. Um, so it was a completely transformed landscape between 1800 and 1900. Um, along with that um, came changes in the animal fauna. Um, and this timeline is showing um, 1800 um, over here on the left. Um, Indiana became a, a state, was admitted to statehood in the US in 1816. Um, and then coming up to the point I was talking about 1870 here, um, and then 1917, um, and then roughly to the present day here, um, showing the proportion of forest, 87%, down to 28, down to 7, um, and then back up to 19. And also the European population, um, the, the American settling population, going from um, only a few thousand in 1800 to nearly a million people by 1870, and to nearly 3 million people by um, 1917. Um, and today it's approximately six. And so this timeline is showing um, particularly mammal species that dropped out through that period. Um, elk and bison, and yes, there were bison in Indiana, um, became extinct quite early. Um, lynx um, also um, extinct pretty early. Um, beaver, which was trapped for pelts, um, and of course inhabited the wetlands that were drained, uh, was gone by 1840. Um, black bear, mountain lion um, or cougar, wolverines and fishers, um, all carnivores that were um, in part purposefully extirpated were gone by mid-century. Um, White-tailed deer were gone by 1880. Um, and any of you who do live in Indiana now know that deer are so abundant that they're almost a pest, but they became um, extinct through this time. Porcupine, spotted, spotted skunk and otter also disappeared. Um, beaver, deer, and otter were reintroduced later. Um, beaver and deer actually have become quite successful. Um, others were not. Um, turkeys were another thing that became um, extinct locally during this period. Um, they're now back. And then quite famously, some um, species became completely extinct, the passenger pigeon and the Carolina parakeet um, that you see there as um, the landscape of Indiana and indeed um, most of Eastern North America was transformed. Um, and any of you who've ever seen the state seal of Indiana, this is it. Um, the state seal of Indiana records that story. Um, you see the modern version of it over on the left and a um, 19th century version over on the right. Um, Indiana is celebrated at cutting down trees, um, the bison um, escaping off to the west into the sunset um, and transforming 
the uh, transforming uh, primeval forest into agricultural landscape that we see today. Um, everything that I have told you about this, coming back to the, the topic of museum specimens, um, all of those dates of when animals disappeared, um, the felling of the trees, the change of the landscape, um, most of that we know in retrospect um, by virtue of museum specimens, um, because there was no, um, there were no ecologists in the 19th century working there. There was no Department of Natural Resources um, or any other conservation organization monitoring wildlife or anything else. Um, we reconstruct that by when the last specimens um, in the state were caught. Um, and here you see um, two kinds of, of museum specimens related to biology. On the left um, is um, from the the ornithology collection at Yale University um, showing some passenger pigeons and Carolina parakeets. Um, it's collections like this that are the places that we um, learn when animals lived and where they lived, um, but also today would be able to reconstruct DNA um, or genomes or whatever from these now completely extinct animals. Um, and on the right are is a fossil collection, um, what I work on fossil carnivores. Um, this one is not at Indiana, um, but it's at the University of Nebraska. Um, but another interesting way that specimens can play an important role in our understanding of the past. Um, this is a fossil specimen from Bloomington, Indiana. Um, you see on the right uh, um, Google street map view of the highway that runs north and south through Indiana and some of the road cuts in the limestone. And um, this fossil was found in the 1970s when that road was widened and the limestone was blasted away and blasted into a sinkhole out of which um, popped a lot of fossils. And one of my um, recent PhD students, Michael Smith, um, restudied these fossils. Um, the one that you're looking at here is the lower jaw of a big cat, which happens to be a jaguar. And one does not normally think of jaguar being uh, living in central Indiana, but one was found in this of the fossil material from this location. Um, and here on the left is a reconstruction of um, the animals that live there. Um, jaguar front and center, this reconstruction by Karen Carr, who did this for the Indiana State Museum. Um, jaguar feasting on a what now extinct peccary. Um, Smilodon sitting there over the shoulder looking on. Um, tortoise there. Um, and over on the right are some of the specimens from this site, um, which are here at Indiana University in the IU Paleontology Collection, um, including the tooth of a saber-toothed cat, uh, maxilla of a dire wolf, um, the extinct peccary and etc. Um, and in fact, this specimen is one of the is is really the only um, record that we have of saber tooth cat in the state of Indiana. Um, these fossils were um, the the animals in, that are fossilized here lived about one hundred and twenty thousand years ago. Um, before our current geological era, there was a um, glacial advance. The last um, so-called ice age, um, and these animals lived in the warm period just before that ice age, and we'll come back to the glacial advances and retreats in a moment. Um, but at that time, um, jaguars and other um, fauna like saber-toothed cats and dire wolves um, coexisted here in an ecological community. Now one of the interesting things is that even in 1800 it is possible that there were jaguar here. Um, Jaguar today is an uh, animal that we think of um, basically exclusively being South American and coming up through Central America into Mexico and right along the U.S. border. And over on the right in orange, you see um, the, the sort of historical range of the jaguar. Um, or sorry, no, I guess you don't. On the, on the right, what you see are um, a database called VertNet. Um, which is um, a recording of museum specimens, where they're located, um, when they were collected, and et cetera, um, which can be used for analyses of how, um, where species have lived in the present and the past. Um, but you'll notice that none of them, I guess it's a little bit hard to say, um, there's a big cluster of them in Southern Florida, um, but none of them really are up in Indiana or um, in the Eastern US, um, but there is some possibility 
that jaguars actually once lived or at least roamed through Indiana um, in the early 19th century. So in this map that you can now see, um, you see in orange the um, historical range of the jaguar, which is sort of in light orange, and then its present almost extirpated range through Mexico, um, which is in the darker orange. Um, but there were reports, um, even by scientists in the 1800s, the early 1800s, of occasional sightings of jaguar. Um, and this on the right is a page report from Constantine Rafinesque, who was um, a naturalist based in Kentucky, um, contemporary of John James Audubon, um, who reported on the quote unquote, the large wandering tigers or jaguars of the United States. And he offered reports from hunters um, based on pelts reported in the news, some of which he'd seen and some of which he did not see um, that seemed to be jaguars. And it is unlikely that there were breeding populations of jaguar here in the 18th century, but it seems quite likely that there were wandering individuals, much as we would get mountain lions occasionally wandering through Indiana today, um, who are um, moving away from their parent population, um, looking for new homes. Um, but we have no really good evidence for this anymore, because if there were specimens of them that were caught, they have not survived to the present. And so the only verification we have for these are reports like Raffinesque, um, so we um, simply wonder, wonder um, what animals were really part of the ecosystem in 1800. We have a partial picture, um, but we do not have a complete picture. Now, coming back to Jean Stratton Porter, um, I've dropped her um, lifespan on this timeline. Um, again, she grew up in Indiana. Um, she was born um, about 1860. I forget exactly which um, exact date. Um, but at that point in her childhood, Indiana would have looked a lot different than it did um, in 1906 when she published um, Girl of the Limberloss. And remember that the, the low point in Indiana's forest was 1917. So by 19... 1906, it was almost gone. Um, so in some ways, it's no wonder that she is um, setting a story um, in what is essentially the deforestation and the draining of Indiana. And it is probably also no coincidence that it was really in the early 1900s that Americans started to think about conservation. Um, so um, Teddy Roosevelt, um, who was president, um, is often seen as a leading conservationist. Um, he was president about the turn of the century. Um, some of the first national parks were established at this time. And that's because the center of the population of the United States was at that point in the Midwest. And everybody who was over 50 years old was living in a world that was completely unlike what they had seen as a child. Um, and in fact, it had probably been pretty ugly for a while, because imagine burning all of those trees, the smoke that would be generated, etc. Um, it was an ecosystem in flux, and one that was rapidly disappearing. Um, the change in that ecosystem didn't only cause species to disappear, um, but there have been new species that have come to Indiana, um, either by um, expansion of their former diversity um, or by invasion of species that weren't here before. Um, so two species that are currently very familiar, um, Eastern Cottontail Rabbits and White-tailed Deer, um, they were probably present historically in 1800, but they would have been rare members of the ecosystem um, because they are dominantly open um, habitat or sort of um, forest edge habitat um, animals. So um, one of the reasons that white-tailed deer um, disappeared so quickly is because they weren't numerous at the time. Um, red fox was probably also not very numerous. Um, plus the red fox that are here today are mostly descendants of European introductions for hunting, which have a brighter um, red colored pelt and replace the um, native red fox subspecies. Um, species like coyote are now um, common members of the ecosystem, um, but they were originally found in Western North America and only expanded eastward um, with the deforestation of um, the former um, Eastern deciduous forest. And so they um, first arrived in Indiana about 1910 um, at the sort of height of um, open agricultural land. Um, and then other species have been slower to expand, the armadillo, um, which in 1800 would have barely been in Texas, 
Um, by the 1970s, it was um, quite um, famously a Texas animal and a Louisiana animal um, and coming up into um, Oklahoma. I remember as a child growing up in Missouri, going to Oklahoma and seeing these animals, which seemed very exotic. Um, but by 1995, they'd expanded up into Nebraska and um, Missouri, um, where they're now quite well established um, and very common to see as roadkill. Um, and in 2013, the nine banded armadillo joined the mammal fauna of Indiana, sort of moving up the Ohio Valley um, into the southern part of the state. And so if you look at Indiana's landscape today, and this is what it looks like if you're passing through an awful lot of it, um, it looks like um, some mixed forest and farmland, but what you're seeing is really the product of 200 years of intensely rapid and profound environmental change um, driven by human activity um, and having cascading effects through ecosystems. Um, today in 2021, um, we think about superimposing on that anthropogenic climate change. And this is um, this slide is showing um, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide at 409 um, parts per million. And this is a slide that every time I give a talk about this, I have to update. And notice the date on this was September 5th, 2019, which is the last time I talked about um, carbon dioxide concentration, but I decided to leave it in this time um, because in August 5th, um, 2021, it was 416. Um, carbon dioxide concentrations are rapidly shooting up. Um, they're not being checked yet. So we are superimposing on 200 years of environmental change, um, a new and very rapid change that I want to come back to that's going to be the major focus um, when I start talking about some research studies. The semester that this series is associated with um, is called the resilience semester, which is a word that is on um, everyone's mind these days. And I want to look back briefly at the origin of that term in the context which is usually used today in, in an ecological and social systems context. And there was a quite important paper um, published by a Canadian ecologist named Buzz Holling, who you see here, called Resilience and Stability of Ecological Systems, uh, published in the Annual Review of Ecology and Systematics, um, which had a, a quite profound impact itself um, and really started um, the study of how um, ecosystems and human societies interact. Um, so a lot of work, um, including um, by Eleanor Ostrom, who was a um, um, who was a, a faculty at Indiana University, who um, became quite um, well known for her studies of um, social and environmental interactions. Um, Holling defined resilience. Um, said resilience determines the persistence of relationships within a system. And he was talking both about ecological systems, but also about societal systems. And it's a measure of the ability of these systems to persist. And he contrasted that with stability, where he said stability on the other hand is the ability of a system to return to an equilibrium state after a temporary disturbance. And so the difference between these really is that resilience allows, resilience is when a system can change, but basically the system is um, still persists even in its change state, whereas stability is coming back to the um, same state. And he developed this diagram, which is um, used and reused all over the place. Um, and I, oh yes, there we go, um, Never mind. I thought I had left something out of it, but I see it now. Um, and what this diagram is, is showing a um, system in flux. Um, Holling was um, highly influenced by mathematical complex systems um, that um, change all the time, um, but somehow or the other may remain resilient. And so what this diagram shows is a um, system that's going through changes, um, which starts off here with exploitation, where the system is at a sort of low potential. Um, it's a recovering system or a system that's just um, developing. So imagine a community that has been devastated by extinction and is starting to exploit resources 
Um, and so it is becoming stronger, more numerous, uh, more diverse, et cetera, um, until it reaches something like a carrying capacity, um, at which point then it starts to, um, in this case, cons conservation does not mean um, preservation, but it means it reaches a steady state um, where it's no longer changing. It's moving at a fairly um, stable or conserved level um, until some tipping point is reached, um, at which point then it crashes. Um, and comes down into what is here called release, um, which means all the rules that govern that system before are gone. Um, it's not necessarily a good place to be, but if the silly, the, um, the system is resilient, um, it will start to reorganize um, after whatever caused it to crash. Um, and then one of two things will happen. Either it will go to extinction and it will not persist, or it will reach a new state and start again. Um, whether that's an optimistic um, reading or not, I'll leave that up to you um, and perhaps the discussion afterwards. Um, but I think it's very relevant um, because of the changes that I've just described that we've gone through, um, where really the state of Indiana has gone through some changes um, where we can imagine um, we were at this conserved state in um, 1800. And now the question is, are we reaching a tipping point or not? And if we are, um, what's going to happen with the reorganization afterwards? And are we going to go into extinction or can we find um, a means um, by which um, we persist? So coming back to um, the climate change on top of this, um, I just reported that um, current atmospheric carbon dioxide levels as of um, this month or last month um, are at about 416 um, parts per million. Um, this was a um, diagram published in 2011 of different scenarios of um, future projections of carbon dioxide to um, 2100, where um, red is we continue to increase um, putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at the same rate we're doing now, and we don't slow down. Um, 4.5 is that we um, change our ways by about 2030 um, and cap the amount going in, and there are other, um, other things in between. Um, and most of us don't think in terms of carbon dioxide. Um, what we really think about is terms of temperature, because of course these are greenhouse gases and um, going along with them as those gases rise, following behind it is um, a global increase in temperature. And so this is basically the same data, um, but now turned into a temperature estimate. Um, this one published from the most recent Intergovernmental um, Panel on Climate Change report from earlier this year. It's technically still in draft stage. Um, but the, the draft, um, except for cop copy editing, has been released. Um, and so you see the, the um, temperatures that go along with these curves, um, with this one of business as usual really taking us to about five degrees um, C, um, five degrees Celsius or centigrade higher than we are today. Um, and notice here the zero line that we're talking about um, is um, the year 2000, um, where we had already been rise, rising um, pretty steadily through the, the last part of the 20th century. Um, and you might ask yourself, what does five degrees C uh, mean? Um, most people who I've asked that question to or who have talked to me about said, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Um, it'll be a little bit warmer. Um, and in fact, some of my um, relatives in Maine have, have or colleagues in Maine have said, you know, that sounds kind of nice. Maine, Maine's cold. It might be nice to be five degrees C warmer. Um, but the thing is that temperature change is not a local one. That is a global one. On average, um, tropics, poles, winter, summer, day, night, etc. And one of the things coming back to paleontology and specimens that um, rings bells with me, alarm bells with me, um, is if we ask ourselves, when was the last time in Earth's history that the temperature was five degrees C different? And that time was about 22,000 years ago. Um, it was the height of the last glaciation and northern Indiana that we just saw being forested was covered by an ice sheet, which in places was more than a mile thick and covered a huge expanse of North America. And the difference in temperature between um, the late 20th century 
and the height of that glaciation was also about five degrees C. Um, this, of course, was five degrees C colder. We're going towards five degrees C warmer. Um, so we're really moving out of an envelope. Um, but one of the the lessons for me as a paleontologist and in a geology department um, is that we can potentially make use of learning what happened in the past when ecosystems or climate went through major transition periods. Um, and when we look back at the past, we know the outcome. We can tell whether things became extinct, whether they rebounded, um, whether ecosystems were reorganized, what the magnitude of that change was. Um, and if we use those data um, creatively, um, we may be able to make better um, sort of confidence envelopes about how worried we should be about five degrees C um, in the coming century. So what I want to do now is show you a study, um, this is sort of the heart of what I want to, to present to you, a study by one of my four former PhD students, Michelle Lawing, um, who was a, got her PhD um, at IU, um, you know, I can't remember the year, but um, probably about five, seven years ago. Um, actually, I didn't, no, I didn't write it down. Uh, and she's now a, a associate professor at Texas A&M University in the Department of Ecology and Conservation Biology. Um, and what I'm about to tell you about was um, really the core of her dissertation work. Um, now, interestingly, Michelle, her study animal were rattlesnakes. Um, she, before she came to Indiana, she had worked, um, done field biology study on rattlesnakes. Um, which, of course, most of us, including myself, do not really like to work with, at least in the living. Um, though Michelle was a quite remarkable person. Um, she loved to go out and catch them, um, carry them around in bags to, to study, take blood from them, and, and do other sorts of things. Um, but rattlesnakes were an interesting um, study system for looking at how climate, geography, um, and um, past environmental change interact because rattlesnakes um, being reptiles are what uh, most people think of as cold-blooded. Therefore, they're very sensitive to temperature changes. Um, winter cold temperature puts a, um, a pretty um, harsh barrier to them. Um, any of you who happen to be from Canada know that um, there are no snakes as you get um, fairly far north in Canada because you're just too cold during the winter. Um, rattlesnakes are also a severely endangered predator species. And even though I didn't mention them in Indiana's um, change, um, the timber rattlesnake was also almost extirpated from eastern North America. Um, it hangs on in Indiana. Um, and one of the, the useful things for Michelle's study is there are quite a few living rattlesnake species, each species inhabiting sort of a different range of climate. Um, and what she did, this is um, three of the living um, rattlesnake species, their historical range, not their current one. Um, but in eastern North America, there was the timber rattler, which you see in green here. Um, the Western Diamondback, uh, which is sort of the famous one from um, Western films um, over in the east. Both of those actually are reasonably well adapted to cold winters, um, so they extend, their ranges extend farther north. Um, but then there are a bunch of species that are found further south in Mexico um, that I'm not even showing here, but one of them that Michelle studied, um, the Mojave rattlesnake in blue. And I'll, I'll use those um, through the next few slides and the color scheme will, will stay the same. Um, those are their, um, essentially their 18th century, if you want to think about it that way, range. Um, it's their historical range before they were impacted by um, European settlement in North America. We know something about their evolutionary history, so we know how long in the past it's been since they diverged to species, and using that information we can reconstruct, given that they're different climate tolerances today, approximately how fast they evolved those climate tolerances. So for example, how fast um, Crotalus horridus, the timber rattler, um, was able to acclimate to um, the cold winters of the eastern United States. We also have fossil occurrences, and over on the right you see dots that show where and when fossils of rattlesnakes were found. Um, so we have some method using fossils to ground truth where they lived in the past and when they lived in the past, just like the specimens um, of the jaguar, um, the lack of specimens of the jaguar are not quite able to do today. Um, but we have a fossil record of them. Um, 
And just a little bit of background about glacial cycles. Um, glacial cycles are an interesting thing um, for this exercise. One, because the excursion between the warm and the cold temperature is um, roughly about the same degree of magnitude of what we're expecting over the next hundred years, um, up to about five degrees um, C. Um, glacial and interglacial cycles have also repeated. Um, there wasn't just one glaciation in North America. It was repeated over and over again. And this diagram that you're seeing here is um, a diagram through time, starting with the present on the left and working our way back in time of what temperature of the globe has done um, over 2.5 approximately million years. Um, we're currently fairly warmish. It was colder at the last glaciation. Then before that, it was warm. That's when the jaguar fossils from Bloomington um, lived. Um, then there was a glaciation before that, an interglacial, and so on. So we've cycled back and forth. The other thing that is useful about this system is that the deglaciations, the time when the glaciers melted, are some of the fastest climate change that we have a good record of um, in the geological past. And so this is one of those, actually two of those cycles. Um, here's the present, um, our current temperature. Um, not so long ago, it was a little bit warmer. We've actually reached that temperature again um, because of anthropogenic warming. Um, but then um, 18,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago was the last glacial maximum that was very cold. Um, so if you look at this through time, a glacial cycle um, starts off warmer, um, it sort of inches down and gets colder and colder and colder, um, then it reaches a threshold and it rapidly gets warm and then it does it again, sort of inches its way down to the coldest part and then it gets rapidly warm. So these rapid warmings are some of the most rapid climate change that we can measure um, fairly accurately in the geological record. So what Michelle did was she took what we know about living rattlesnakes, um, and this cartoon illustration here is showing an example. Imagine there's a species that inhabits this part of Florida um, and the coast of the Gulf and the Atlantic. Um, you can take that species and um, determine what its climate space is. What is the maximum temperature? What's the minimum temperature? What's the driest month? What's the wettest month that it experiences um, from year to year? And find the climate space um, where that um, animal fits or that species fits. Um, and if you know the climate space, then you can um, essentially create a model of where that species might be able to live. And it might be able to live, it, of course it can live where it lives today, um, but you may be able to identify other places where it could live, at least based on the climate. Um, but the important part of that is once you know where it could live based on the climate, then you can go back in time and estimate where it might have lived, where it was compatible, um, where it could have lived or not lived um, in the geological past. And so Michelle took um, what we know about the evolutionary relationships and extrapolating back um, how quickly these species are able to adapt to past um, environmental change estimated from that evolutionary tree. Um, she took um, what we know about Earth's global temperature, and this is that same glacial interglacial cycle um, shown here, um, um, but just turned around. So we're going from older time to younger time at the top. Um, and she was able to scale um, what the habitat and what the climate would have looked like um, in the past to figure out where rattlesnakes might have lived um, and then use those fossil occurrences to ground truth whether the model was telling her the right thing. Um, and this is an animated version of what she found. Um, what you're seeing here, um, there's a little time um, ball on the left. Um, we're marching backwards in time from the present when you saw all three of those geographic ranges spread out as they are today, um, going back to the last glaciation um, when most of North America was covered by ice. And remember, these are rattlesnakes. They don't tolerate that cold, so they get pushed down south um, into Florida, out west, down into Mexico, et cetera, and they have much smaller ranges. And then when it's warm, they expand again. Um, so what we're modeling here, what Michelle was modeling, is the expansion and contraction of these species as the climate changed. And by doing this, because she's got the geography of these species um, here on the map, um, she can use that to measure for every degree C um, there was temperature change in the past, how much did the geographic range of these 
species change, and where did their location, because they're sort of moving south and then expanding north, moving south, expanding north, but also contracting into what are called glacial refugia and expanding out of them. And from that, she could calculate rates. Um, how much do we expect the geography of these species to change with a certain amount of um, time or temperature? And she did two things with that. One, she um, estimated the rate at which they were able to adapt to the climate change. So in other words, um, the rate at which they could evolve in order to keep up with the changing temperature, either um, becoming more tolerant to warm or to cold temperatures, and to what extent did they have to move or track that um, in order to follow their more optimum temperature. Um, and you don't have to get a whole lot out of this graph. What it is is, is those rates at, at every time in the past 350,000 years. Um, but these little gray or white balls up here are showing the rate at which they're moving. Um, and the gray balls down here are the rate at which they're adapting. And this is on a log scale. Um, so basically um, there are two log units for one, from one another. So in other words, the amount or the rate at which these species could adapt to the environmental change is two orders of magnitude slower or a hundred times slower than the amount they had to move um, to geographically keep um, themselves in a climate which they could tolerate. In other words, they're not in, in this Pleistocene in the glacial interglacial cycles, they were not evolutionarily able to keep up with it. They had to track the climate change. They couldn't evolve fast enough to cope with the glaciations and deglaciations. Um, and remember, those are the fastest um, climate changes that we have um, in the geological record. Um, but I want to briefly show you that those fast climate changes in human terms were pretty slow. And these little contour lines here, this is um, New England and New York. Um, these contour lines are showing the melting of the ice at that rapid warming. And so what is rapid geologically, um, the ice was here 28,000 years ago, um, and then we're going down to 18,000, 17,000, 15,000, 13,000. So there are several thousand years that it took that ice to melt. So what was rapid with the glacial um, interglacial cycles um, in human terms is really several millennia. Uh, and so predicting for the next century, um, one of the things that Michelle realized from this research is we're going to change over a century what it would have taken several thousand years to change in this geological past. But she could also take um, her estimates. Um, so from the geological information, she could estimate what was the change in geographic area um, needed for each degree um, Celsius, um, and what would be the, our minimum change um, in the coming hundred years, what would be our maximum change, and how much would the distribution of these rattlesnakes um, have to change in order to do that. And so they will have to change um, somewhere between, let me look at my decimal points, um, about 100,000 square kilometers um, to maybe up to about 700 50,000 square kilometers is what their geographic range change is going to be. And if you compare that to um, how much land we set aside for conservation purposes or wildlife, um, the entire state of Indiana is 93,000 um, square kilometers. So the entire state of Indiana is way down here. And some of the largest um, wildlife preserves in the United States, like Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, the last presidential administration cut back because they thought it was too big, is only 7,000 square kilometers, way down here. So the scale that we're looking at over the next hundred years is um, arguably bigger than we're prepared for. Um, so what does that mean for rattlesnake future? Here are some of Michelle's predictions. Um, these are the modern ranges, historical ranges. Um, if we change by only 1.1 degree C by the year 2100, they'll be affected some, but not too bad. Um, but if we go that full um, five degrees C so that we jump up to um, 6.4 higher than um, pre-industrial levels, um, the timber rattler will ha basically have no more habitat and the others won't either. So it's not great for the timber rattler. And not only that, but this year, 
we already passed the 1.1 degree C. Um, it's too late for that scenario. Um, we're on to um, some of the others. And so to finish this off, um, coming back to the idea of extinction, um, we also know a lot from paleontology and geology about mass extinctions. Um, and those have also been learned from museum specimens, um, because if we're calculating um, what the extinction pattern is across the entire globe, I cannot go out and collect enough fossils to do that. Um, instead, what we do is tabulate um, all of the fossils that have been ever, ever been collected. Um, and this is a, a an exercise that paleontologist Jack Sapkowski um, started doing um, in the 1980s and 1990s. And he collected all the data you could get from the fossil record to um, estimate um, how many species or how many um, genera or families, which are a proxy for species, there were that lived at any there were at any given time in Earth history. And this is the long Earth history, 541 million years ago to the present. Um, and this wiggly line is essentially an estimate of the number of species that lived at um, any given time uh, in, a, in a very coarse way using genus instead of species. Um, but what you can see early in Earth's history, there weren't many species. Diversity increased. We got a lot of them. Um, it wavered back and forth, um, and then it's increased again. But these dips are extinction events, um, and these are so-called mass extinction. It was Sapkowski who first identified these. Um, one of them is quite famous. Almost everybody knows about it. When the asteroid hit, um, dinosaurs became extinct. Um, that dip right there is that extinction event. It is not by any means the worst extinction that's ever happened. That was here at the Permian Triassic. But Sipkowski was um, able to identify that there had been five major mass extinctions in Earth history that really reset. They were definite tipping points where there was recovery afterwards. Um, Sepkoski's data um, and data from fossils in collections all around the world um, are amalgamated. If you're interested in what's called the paleobiology database, and what you're looking at here is the interface to that database that helps make that those um, data accessible to researchers. And in those data are data from the Indiana University paleontology collection. And each one of the dots on there um, is a fossil from somewhere in the world um, during all of geological history. Um, but having identified those, um, those five mass extinctions, we now ask ourselves, are we in the middle of a sixth extinction? And those of you here on Indiana University campus, um, Elizabeth Colbert, who published a popular book on this question, um, The Sixth Extinction, An Unnatural History, was a visitor um, last night, I think, um, earlier this week anyway, um, talking about her book, The Sixth Extinction, and asking the question, are we in the middle of one? Um, so rounding us back out to um, where I started with Indiana and, and the girl of the Limberlost and the change um, that preceded climate change from 1800 to 2021, um, I would say, um, looking at this as a paleontologist, that we're well past stability. Um, there just is no possible way with human habitation and everything else that we could go back to the stable state of 1800, um, especially when we're superimposing climate change on it. Um, resilience is our goal, um, not stability. Um, so I'll just end. Um, I don't have any good... good um, outcomes of this per se, um, but I certainly um, think about some questions to ask. Um, what exactly does it mean to be resilient um, in the current world? What does it mean to be sustainable? Um, what are we trying to preserve? What are we trying to sustain? Um, what do we want to see regrow um, in the sense of Hollings um, resilience? How can we better predict what will happen? Um, that's something we can do with museum specimens. What sort of scale of preparation is necessary? And it's studies like Michelle's that really give us sort of an idea of the envelope of scales. Um, what kind of preparation will be most effective? Um, so imagining those expanding and contracting ranges, it may be that we don't want to um, conserve in one particular area. We may want to make room for um, species to change their ranges and reorganize. And how can we um, how can research on museum? specimens help that. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions or have discussion about this. Thank you so much for that, David. That was 
Fantastic. And as David just mentioned, if you have questions, you can go ahead and share them now, either in the questions and answers spot or the, the chat there, and we're keeping an eye on those. Um, I love the point that you made just now about museum collections helping us uh, predict, make predictions for the future, because we so often, I think, think of collections either literally or metaphorically as these um, documents of the past, you know, storage. I mean, people even talk about dusty collections or things that are frozen, but um, this is such an outstanding example of what that helps us do, not only understanding our present times, but looking toward the future. So thank you for that. And also, um, I love the interdisciplinary nature of what you shared, you know, starting with literature and looking at that and, and seeing how that's also a record. I mean, I think a lot of us are familiar with the idea of diaries or, you know, photographic ref records as being something that we look to, but also looking to artistic depictions, whether those are paintings or something in literature. Is that something, um, drawing particularly on a literary example, um, is that something that you hear a lot of your colleagues doing? Is that sort of a, um, an unusual type of project to, to pull that in? It was very effective. I don't, there. I don't know. Um, certainly my knowledge of it is, is very idiosyncratically personal. I moved to Indiana 15 years ago and I knew very little about it. I had not lived here before. And so I wanted to know more about the natural history. I wanted to know more about the fossil record. I wanted to know about the culture. So I, um, one, learn the story about the Midwest, and I grew up in the Midwest, and I, I knew sort of primary school discussions about, yes, there were, there were pioneer settlers who cleared fields, um, but did not have any concept of what the scale of that was. I would never have imagined that Indiana was 87% forested, so that was eye-opening for me. At the same time, I was reading you know, classic books that um, people who grew up in Indiana might have read and read that one and realized, oh, this woman is telling the same story from, from that point of view of 1900. Um, so my, my connection between them is, is very, very personal. Uh, but yeah. they do resonate without any question. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, it really is quite staggering to think of. It's, it's hard to imagine what that would have been like at 87% um, forestation. And I know that we talk, especially in Bloomington, this has been a large topic of local concern. I mean, as we look at expansion of things like I-69 and, and the types of things that have to do there, but then to think about just the sheer scale um, of of what's there. There's, there's only a handful of people um, in, in the audience right now. Can we let them in as, that, as participants? That would be okay if they want to. So I think what'll happen, I'm gonna ask um, Elizabeth, our coordinator, uh, who's behind the scenes I here. I recognize almost all of them, so. And promote people. And I think what will happen is they will be invited then to come okay. on so that we won't be forcing anyone suddenly out into the screen. They will have a choice. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask yeah. Elizabeth to go ahead and work on promoting people. And then if you don't want to do that, that's fine. You are welcome to mm -hmm. stay hanging out where you are, but otherwise you're welcome to come on in. And while that's happening, um, I'm going to ask you, I had told you that if we had a, a little bit of a lull, I had some questions about the paleontology collection. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you just to take this moment, if you would, and tell us a little bit more about the IU paleontology collection. And that can be whatever you'd like to tell us, either sort of scope or scale or specialties or whatever you'd like while people are coming in and joining us. And yeah, well, pa paleontology collections and also the, the ornithology and whatever, um, in general, they, there are a lot of them. And one of the reasons that's true is that um, you know, they're, they're collected by human researchers who have a finite amount that they can collect, um, but it is very important for the science of paleontology or, or any of these others to have voucher specimens that somebody else can come study. So the Indiana University Paleontology Collection grew through the research of people who have been here in the past, who collected the fossils, they published papers about them, they um, drew conclusions from them, but they put them in a repository um, here at Indiana University so other people can either come back and verify the research that they did or come do new studies on it. So Jack Sapkowski's, for example, is an example, is, is a new study um, where the people who collected all the fossils he used 
that wasn't what their question was, but he was able to go through um, publications and museum specimens and and use those. So our collection has something like 1.3 million fossils, most of them from the central part of the United States, and they're used by researchers here, but they're also used by researchers from around the world who are working on some problem that involves um, either a global scale thing or the North American problem, and they either come visit this collection or, or borrow things from it. And so my own research and even Michelle Lowing's research that I just described um, is based on collections here, there, and everywhere and synthesized together. So they, they form something a lot like what a, a manuscript archive would serve to a historian or to a literary scholar. Yeah, and you have just given me an excellent opportunity to uh, put in a commercial here. The Institute for Advanced Study here at IU has what we call the Repository Research Fellowship, and we invite external researchers to propose a project using one of our partner repositories, and the IU Paleontology Collection has been one of our partners in that, and uh, they can come in and conduct research there. And uh, during COVID times recently, we switched that to a virtual fellowship, which was very successful. So we're working on expanding that as well. But we look forward to when it is safe and feasible for people to travel and come back to campus again to do that kind of work. Um, and also, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, and you mentioned VertNet in what you were doing, but we're also seeing a lot more digital sharing, I think, mm -hmm. in different ways, not only of paleontology collections, but of lots of collections where mm -hmm. there are either um, digital proxies or just the, the data is entered in ways that mm -hmm. you can access. Uh, and yes. I know that you all participated in that here quite a bit as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in fact, through VertNet, you can often get to photographs of specimens in, in the museums and et cetera. And, and yes, that makes it a lot easier. So when I was doing my PhD work, um, you had to travel to every museum that you needed some data from and collect it and see what was there and et cetera. Um, whereas now it's easy to, to get quite a bit of data even without going to them and certainly about um, what's going to be there when you get there. Um, I see Alexander and Peter and Sylvia are here and also uh, maybe I'm Claire and, and Ruth. Hi to everybody. Yeah, and, and you all are welcome all to chime in if you have questions or comments or just want to offer your congratulations on this fantastic talk, which we really do appreciate, David. Alexander, at least, is in Germany, I assume. <laughs> Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Fantastic talk. I liked it very much. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for coming. Yeah, I, I I'm I'm not sure how how good the connection is, but um, and and I'm I'm on my home PC, so I don't have a camera. But um, yeah, you, you briefly touched the topic of, of tipping points. Um, and I think this is, this is something which is, which, is, um, which is even on the news, at least in Europe, that, that mm -hmm. you know, whether we touch a tipping point or whether we are already over it and things like that. And, and I was wondering, um, given, given your overview of the fossil record, whether you think that it will be possible to, to, to track tipping points in the morphology of species, at, at least certain lineages which have a, a good record, you know? That's a really good question. Um, certainly not at the scale of a century, uh, for better or worse. Um, and even, even extinction tipping points at the scale of a century, we're, we're now moving so fast compared to anything that's happened um, that that's mind boggling in itself. Um, and I guess I don't really know. It's, it's, a, it's a very worthwhile question to ask, and I've kind of tried to ask it in some of my research, um, but it's entirely probable that as you would have an environmental reorganization and an ecosystem reorganization, not only would you have a remixing of some species becoming extirpated, some new species coming in, but as they adapt to one another, um, in theory, there ought to be changes in diet and way of life and everything else that would have a selective effect on, on morphology. Um, and in theory, um, morphology can evolve pretty quickly. Um, so it would really be the limitations of 
the record that you have and potentially doing modeling to extrapolate between the data points in that record to, to try to get it finer sc scales in between it. Oh, wow. I don't know if Sylvia has any, any thoughts about that. She's worked with very fine scale measurements of teeth and diet. Hi, uh, excuse my jacket. Um, it's really cold. <laughs> in my yes, we've just been renovated here and, and Sylvia is local just down the hall and it's not warm in this building. No, it's not warm. Um, so yeah, that's why I look like I'm in the North Pole or something. Um, I really don't um, don't have a input. Like it's, it's puzzling. It's one of the questions that we want to solve and then we want to explore, right? Um, whether like morphology will keep up with this or whether like current morphology actually is um, cap like provides these species with a better niche that we can anticipate because they've never had to be in this type of environments, but they actually can be in this type of environments. I've been working with niche models uh, recently and, and like, uh, we see that um, you know species now live in different type of climates than they did before a human study like changing the environment. Um, but to what extent the morphology is going to play a role, I think it's still an area of exploration, uh, which is amazing because it means that we have many projects to think about. Um, but I don't think that we have the answer right now. Um, <laughs> Long yeah, story. The, the the signal from from insect research is also a mixed one. Um, as far as I overview the topic from from the entomological viewpoint, um, you know we have so, some studies report that that insects become smaller when it gets warmer. Um, but at the same time, there are other studies which which doesn't show which do not show that for for other lineages. And then there's, there's the, the effect that um, some species become bigger, but their wings uh, do, not, do not scale um, uh, with the same isometric signal. So actually that could mean that, that species are less, less good fleers um, and get, get caught by predators more easily, which, which then you know, trickles down to, to ecological effects and things like that. So yeah, that, that's, that's something which, which re really, um, yeah, keeps me thinking, you know, um, especially when you concern, uh, when you think about modeling aspects and, and how we can model the reaction of, of phenotypes uh, given projected climatic changes until 2100. Um, and, and how that would affect actually, um, yeah, profit levels and, and interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Toby, oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I haven't looked at exactly that question, but there, there is a series of studies I just finished on Miocene carnivores. And part of what I was asking um, it wasn't exactly a morphological rates of evolution question, but it was asking how the average morphology in communities changed as you went through expansion of grasslands, um, contraction of grasslands, and then moving into the quaternary. And I did try to measure something about the chain, the, essentially the turnover in the species and what traits they brought with them versus how much they were evolving in situ. And the, the evolving, sort of like with Michelle's study that I just reported, the evolving in situ was a much slower process than the trading off species that are able to survive in a particular community. So I would, I would guess that, the, that the, the first effect of the tipping point is going to be remixing the species. And then as using Hollings terms, as you're sort of making that coming around and doing the reorganization that it would be in the reorganization that things would either um, remain in that system or fall out of it um, based on how fast they could then adapt to each other which might be when the morphology kicks in but it's a really good a really good question and I know a lot of people are looking at it in different ways mm. yeah 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions or comments before we wrap up today? Yeah, like I have a question for you, David. Um, mm -hmm. You ask, like us, to discuss um, how would we describe resilience? How would you describe resilience? Um, I don't know. Um, I have to say that that really before looking at some of the the more technical literature on it, um, I always imagined it meant what stability meant in the definitions that I just gave, that a resilient system was something that could be perturbed and then come back to, to normal. Um, taking Hollings definition and looking at the long-term history of life on earth, um, in some ways you might interpret it as um, life persists. Um, so looking at the Permian Triassic extinction, um, one could call that one of those tipping points and 95% of the species became extinct. Um, and so what was resilient about it was just simply that life and terrestrial ecosystems and et cetera persevered. Um, not that there was really anything saved from what was there before. Um, so that's a pretty, um, uh, I don't think it's what most people are thinking about when they're hoping for resilient systems. Um, Holling himself was really working with uh, things like fisheries. And so could a fishery rebound um, after, so he was looking at things where you were managing to preserve cod, for example, um, and you were managing that ecosystem so that cod were doing well, and they would be doing well and doing well and doing well. But what he realized is that as they were doing well, there were all sorts of other things that were changing around it that weren't being managed. And suddenly you hit a tipping point where the whole system collapsed, and then you would rebuild it. Um, so in his sense, he was rebuilding a cod, but in a new, slightly new context, um, which is a, a more palatable version. So I don't, I don't expect in any way whatsoever that humans will be gone in 500 years, um, but what the world around our descendants 500 years from now looks like and what society looks like, I just can't imagine because I think surely we are heading for um, some major changes one way or the other. Well, thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. David Polly, for this talk and sharing this information with us. We hope that some of you will join us again for more talks in this series. Our next one is on October 6th, and it will be Dr. Joshua Bell of the Smithsonian's Anthropology Department and the National Museum of Natural History. We're making full use of the wonderful technology that allows us to do webinars so that we can connect with our colleagues wherever they are. Um, and he'll be talking with us about cellular technology and their upcoming exhibit, um, Cell Phones, Unseen Connections, and thinking about issues such as um, technology infrastructures, supply chains, environmental impact um, of use of minerals and elements that are needed for these technologies. So we hope that you all will join us again. Thank you very much. Thank you all.